and there's the smell. Yeah. And there's the smell of kerosene. kerosene yeah. That's superb. Um, that's, that's just the remaining unburnt that's left in the vaporizer system when it uh, blew out. That's incredible. That is incredible. Every time I take this from you, you look nervous. <laughs> I won't drop it, so, I promise. Yeah. Just out of interest, I mean, I, I know... Mm, the, yep, the, yep. What's the value of something like this? Something like that, uh, because it is actually producing quite small quantity or small volume, yeah. uh, a wheel like that will cost... Uh, I suppose in real terms it, it's it's cheap, but you're still looking about 160 pounds yeah, for okay, one of those. Okay, for one of these guys here. <laughs> well, I'll hand that right back to okay. you. <laughs> so, James, what is the biggest learning curve, or the or the or the the hardest thing to overcome when uh, designing and making your own jet engine? Jet engine. It's actually understanding, using a technical term, the thermodynamics okay. of the engine. Okay. Uh, basically, as we mentioned earlier, it's heat, the whole engine works on heat transfer. Yeah. And in simple terms, what we're trying to do is get air to come in cold, heat it up, accelerate it out of the back end, and thrust is the net difference between the speed the air goes in at and the speed the air comes out at and how much it weighs. Okay. To put it in uh, a simple terms, if you were to stand on, let's say, a skateboard and you had a row of bricks in front of you, the bricks represent air and you are the engine, so you pick up the brick, standing on the skateboard, and you throw it. Okay. Action and reaction. So the art that so the me throwing that throw brick will, will, will pull me backwards. Backwards yep. to the next brick, which you then pick up and throw it again. <laughs> okay. To the next brick. And that is essentially what a jet engine is doing. Yeah. The brick is the air yeah. coming in, and it's coming in slowly at the front end, and by heating the air. Is expanding so it has to come out a lot lot faster which is exactly what I'm doing throwing the brick I'm just expelling it a lot quicker from the speed I picked it up at versus the speed I actually throw it at yeah and that's all a jet engine is actually doing is accelerating a mass so what's the hardest thing when you when you when you manufacture one of these in your mm -hmm. workshop here is it the balance is the it... balance I think is probably the the black art that actually takes a while to get right. right. Okay. I mean, most of it, any engineer, any model engineer, should be able to make all the components. Obviously, you're buying the two wheels. Those are by far the most complicated part. If you had to make those, it would be very difficult. But the fact that you're able to buy them, everything else can be made in an average model workshop, really relatively simply. Yeah. And an average uh, lathe like uh, this Myford Super 7 here yeah. um, is more than capable of, of the accuracy required. Uh, the shaft is probably the critical component because it's got to be absolutely perfect uh, on its centers. Yes. Any slight um, imbalance Mm -hmm. causes issues uh, later on for the bearings etc but even if you make the shaft perfectly so as the two wheels slot on the ends even a turbocharger are not perfectly balanced mm. and we like to balance them more accurately because if you think about a, a turbocharger in an engine it's inside a very uh, heavy cast iron and cast aluminium housing, housing yeah, yeah. which is then bolted to the side of either a cast aluminium or a cast iron block of an engine. So you have a huge damping effect. Yeah. So slight imbalances actually in there will not be felt in the car. Here we have a housing which weighs yeah, no more than a half a kilogram. So any imperfections in that rotating mass, and as I said earlier, you've got each of those blades is, is a becomes equivalent to approximately two tons when it's up to speed, any imbalance will shake this engine to pieces. So the art obviously is, is to balance that 
rotor set. Now that is, I think it could be called more of a black art yeah. okay. <laughs> in the science. Yeah. Well, I see when you fire this one up sometimes, you put, yep. your, you put your hand close to it to, yep, yep. to I will feel yep. the, the vibrations. vibrations. Yeah. Yep. Are they good vibrations? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm always hoping for. <laughs> yeah, no, I always, particularly when I'm running in public, yeah. uh, when I've got people around me, yeah. the finger is a remarkably sensitive vibration sensor. Yeah. yeah. Far more than anything yeah. electronic. Yeah. So it's a lot easier just yeah. to keep a... Yeah. Uh, and I, let's say uh, test that the vibrations are within acceptable limits. If it starts getting too much, then there's a danger it will uh, thrash itself apart, in which case I'll just shut it down and it will you know, safely shut down and stop. So what about equipment? What kind of equipment do you need to be able to make and uh, create your own jet engine? Uh, well, we've had a good look around your workshop, workshop earlier. I yep. um, uh, see so you've got a lathe. Yeah. Um, so I suppose that's sort of quite critical for making uh, the the. the Practically, if you look at it, I mean, it's yeah. all essentially cylinders so of one sort or another. A big rotator, so isn't it? Yeah, basically, yeah. a large amount of yeah. uh, rotating. Yeah. There is a small amount of milling. Okay. Uh, which I actually do manually again on the lathe, yep. but with a vertical slide. Yeah. So converting it into a little mini a lathe. Little mini mill. Yeah. yeah. A mi yeah, yeah. Mini, yeah. Uh, yeah. mini mill from yeah. uh, a standard lathe. Yeah. Uh, so there are components in, inside, particularly what we call the diffuser, mm -hmm. uh, because, as we say, we're sucking air in by the compressor, and the centrifugal compressor relies on basically accelerating that air at a huge speed. So the air will actually come in at full throttle, just to give you a rough idea, the air uh, is what you call induced, it's sucked in, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, at full throttle that is approximately 120 meters per second. Right. Okay. Uh, it needs to be traveling that fast because you're going to try and get five cubic feet of air through that hole per second. Yeah. So it's got to be moving quite <laughs> fast. a lot of air. <laughs> Uh, but by the time it gets to the tip of this rotor, which is approximately just where uh, uh, this flange is, that air is moving nearer to 400 meters per second. Mm. So it's accelerated in a very, very short, short channel. Short time. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but that hasn't given us actually any major pressure rise. That's given us a, a small proportion of our pressure rise. So what we have is what's called a diffuser system where the channels start off small and get gradually bigger so the air slows down okay. as it passes through those yeah. channels and that provides what's called a pressure recovery. So the pressure by slowing down actually builds back up again um, and as it comes off the tip of the diffuser it's actually only traveling at about 80 meters per second. So it's gone from 120 up to 400, back down to 80, inside about 60 millimeters. Okay. <laughs> so we've, we've, <laughs> we've, gone, we've, gone, we've gone from 200 to 400, yeah. back down to 80, to, yeah. in, 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 in a couple in, of inches. In basically. a couple of yeah. inches, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the dynamics of that, the designing of that is, takes quite a lot of thinking about. Yeah. Um, and as I say, it's, it's all to do with thermodynamics. And what you have to be considering in your uh, calculations, if you calculate it, it's a lot of calculating, um, because you are having to consider uh, temperature, pressure, and uh, density mm, mm. and as all those speeds change all those values change for that bit of air at any particular point through that wheel mm. so what you actually have to do is work out exactly what that air is doing in order to size these channels correctly um, and what we've actually found that there are certain rules of thumb that you can work to okay yeah which enables you to at least make a good crack at it without being uh, a mathematician okay. of uh, the level of Einstein. <laughs>
Then, then also on your rig here, there's quite a lot of electronics. Um, yep. So I'm guessing you're doing a bit of monitoring. It looks like a little uh, microcontroller over there and a display as well. Absolutely. So, and, and quite a few pipes and, and um, various other bits and pieces. So what, what, what are you doing um, on, on the outside of this jet on engine? On the outside of the jet engine. What we're trying to do, this, none of this or very, very little of this is actually needed for the functioning of the engine. Sure. Yeah? What so, it is here is research and development. Okay. So having calculated out what it should do, yeah. what this does is actually tells us what it is actually doing. Okay. Yeah? So it, it, it's one of those things that we design it, we say this is what it should do, we then put it on the rig, test it up, and say, well, okay, it's close, or no, we've miss something somewhere because something's not right and we need to take another look. So this is basically then a test rig test that gives rig, you yeah. the ability to be able to look inside your engine and see Absolutely. what's happening. Yep. Yeah. So just yeah. as an example, this little box here okay. gives us 12 channels of pressure. Okay. So we can actually monitor 12 different positions on the engine to give us tell us what the pressures are doing and you'll see most of the pipes are actually coming in the compressor because at the end of the day it's the compressor that actually we are reliant on on getting those pressures right in the first instance so you'll see the very first tube here is actually just looks like it's in open space because it's just in the front of the intake here before we even get to the compressor okay and that will actually act uh, like um, a venturi pressure will drop and if you know an area and the pressure drop will tell you what the actual velocity is. Okay, so you yeah, can calculate yeah, you the can, speed of the wind, wind yeah. <laughs> in there. Exactly. <laughs> so, little pitot tube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Fantastic. They used so, to put those on the front of aeroplanes. Aeroplanes, they, they <laughs> did indeed. Give, give the pilot some yeah. clue how well, fast he was going. That was his ASI, <laughs> his airspeed <laughs> indicator. indicator. Yeah, fantastic. So then we have a uh, similar uh, pipe on the discharge side of the compressor. So that will give us actually what the compressor wheel it's doing itself, how that is actually compressing the air from the point the air comes in the intake to the point it leaves the tip of the compressor. And then we also have another uh, pipe which is actually inside the case. Mm -hmm. So it's after the diffuser. So we've got that pressure recovery. So we should see a higher pressure inside the case compared to the pressure coming off the compressor because we've recovered that pressure in the diffuser section. And this is and these are all plastic pipes and we can get yep, away yep. with that because we're at the cold end of the engine here. Yep, you? we are indeed at the cold end, uh, the cold end and this is why everything's made of aluminium at this end because we're not getting very hot. Although it can surprise you uh, that the action of compressing air Warms it up. Warms as well. it up. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, yeah. and, and again, the tip temperature uh, at full full speed, 120,000 uh, RPM, uh, is approximately 150 degrees centigrade. And that's before it's even that's seen any any combustion. Hasn't seen any fuel at all. Yeah. By that. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then so at the back end of the engine, then we've got a, a, a few um, what look like, well, they uh, look like pressure, pressure sensors, are they? They are actually. Or temperature. Yeah, uh, they're temperature. So they're yeah, like JK yeah. thermocouples yeah, or something. K, so yeah, K like, thermocouples. K thermocouples. They, they, they okay. give us the widest temperature range, right. uh, certainly within the range we're looking at, which is up to uh, just over a thousand degrees. James, how do you know <laughs> how much fuel to put in this engine? Basically, as you can see, there are no carburetors. Yes. Yeah? We're actually just pumping fuel into the combustion chamber. Okay. Now a jet engine... Do you have a pump? We do. So there is actually the, a physical a pump. A physical pump. Okay. It's a gear pump. Yeah. Um, and we actually have to raise the pressure higher than what the compressor is putting into the engine. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise the fuel goes the wrong way. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah, so okay. we have to have a pressure pump that can actually get the fuel into the combustion chamber against the pressure of the engine. Okay. Now a jet engine, it, it's actually completely self-regulating. 
no matter how much fuel you put in it, it will essentially accelerate to the point where the air coming in balances the amount of fuel there. So that what restricts call... the, 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 the highest speed, speed that it can spin mm, at. Yes and no. Okay, <laughs> all right, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. So we basically, to make it accelerate, we initially pump more fuel. That creates more heat, greater expansion, makes the turbine turn f uh, more with more energy, so yeah. more torque, yeah. which accelerates the compressor which sucks in more air, which burns more efficiently with that extra fuel that we've been putting in, okay. to a point where it meets what you call the stoichiometric mix, which is the ideal fuel-air balance, okay. where the flame is burning cleanly and efficiently, and the engine will then stop at that speed. Okay. It will run at that speed yep. until you adjust the speed or the amount of fuel going in. Right. So if you reduce the amount of fuel going in, it'll slow down. It'll slow down yep. until it meets that mix again. Okay. Understood. Yeah. So what's the so so if you just I mean, obviously, you couldn't crank it up to to the point where you just poured loads of fuel in there. You but, can, but, there's, but there's but there's a but there's a saturation <laughs> point, isn't there? I mean, uh, no. no, no. So the more fuel you put in, it the will go faster, faster and, and faster, faster, and it'll run away with itself. It will. Wow. It will actually eventually destroy itself. Really.